First of all, could we have all mics muted as we commence the afternoon's activity? Okay, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are about to commence this afternoon's event, which forms part of the 2021 World Food Day program of activities. The World Food Day theme this year is our actions are our future. Better production, better nutrition, a better environment, and a better life. My name is Colville King. I'm the Agricultural Diversification Officer in the Ministry of Agriculture and Chairman for today's proceeding. Let me acknowledge members of the virtual head table, the Honorable Subato Caesar, Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, Fisheries, Rural Transformation, Industry and Labor. Honorable Orlando Brewster, Minister of National Mobilization, Social Development, local government, gender affairs, family affairs, housing and informal settlement. Mr. Juan Shears, lead technical officer in the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. Ms. Antoinette Duncan, youth assistant youth officer, youth affairs department. Ms. Cornelia Stowe and Mr. Azakai Edwards, youth representative, uh, primary beneficiaries of this project. I also wish to acknowledge the other officials and representatives in the audience, uh, staff of the FAO sub-regional office for the Caribbean, the national correspondent in St. Vincent, Dr. Phillips, the permanent secretary, chief agricultural officer and colleagues of the ministries, Ministry of Agriculture, permanent secretary, youth officer and other colleagues in the Ministry of National Mobilization, representative of other collaborating agencies, members of the Youth in Agriculture groups, Chateau Passion, Youth in Agriculture Multipurpose Cooperative in Baibu, and the Innovative Youth in Agribusiness Multipurpose Cooperative in Leyu and Environs. Media representatives, we also acknowledge you, and it is my pleasure to welcome you, one and all, to this suspicious event. It is, a, it is quite fitting to commemorate this year's World Food Day theme by officially launching the Youth Agri Entrepreneurship for Rural Development Project. This project will be jointly implemented between the Ministries of Agriculture and the Ministry and that the Ministry of National Mobilization, and it is funded by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. Accordingly, it is only fair and fitting to have representative of these key agencies address you at today's launch. They would provide the context, the project outcomes and aspirations, and next step for you this afternoon. All right. However, to set the stage, I now call on Ms. Cornelia Stowe to bless us this afternoon's proceeding with a word of prayer, and this would be followed by a rendition of the national anthem. Ms. Stowe. Bow our heads and close our eyes as we look to God in prayer. Almighty and loving Father, creator of heaven and earth, we praise you and adore you. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We humbly ask your forgiveness for our sins. We are gathered here today for the launching of the Youth Agri-Entrepreneurship for Rural Development. Send us your Holy Spirit to be our guide and give us the wisdom to understand everything that would be discussed. Enlighten our minds and let your love be upon us. May this launch bring success and growth to our team. We thank you, Father, for this precious time that you have given us. This we pray through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Amen.
Okay, so thank you, Ms. Do, and uh, we welcome and uh, see what blessing we will see them please. I'm getting a terrible feedback. Okay, come in. All right, so as we proceed. So let me call to get uh, just now, just to ask persons to mute your mics. Okay, so thank you very much, Ms. To, for that wonderful prayer and for the anthem. Thank you very much. Now, as we proceed uh, speedily along, we'd like to, I'd like to invite to address us, Ms. Antoinette Duncan, Assistant Youth Officer in the Youth Affairs Department to brief you with some comments regarding the project and which would provide you with some backdrop as to the basis for uh, this project intervention. Thank you, Ms. Internet. Thank you, Colville. A pleasant afternoon. The Youth and Agriculture Program started on the 10th of February, 2018 at Overland as a pilot project through the Youth Affairs Division and headed by former PS Gatos McMillan, where she played a pivotal role and still doing so along with my minister, Dr. Brewster, permanent secretary, Ms. DeFreitas, and my supervisor, Mrs. Anthony, in getting where the program is today. The program mantra is to choose agriculture as a viable economic choice for sustainable development. The program then expanded throughout St. Vincent Grenadines in six different communities, namely Bayabu, Chateaubelle, Leu, Kittels, North Union, and Beckway. On the 21st, 2020, Overland and Bayabu merged into a cooperative, while the other groups are in the process. Presently, the three beneficiary groups involved in green seasoning and land cultivation while making and also in the process of provision vacuum packaging. Under this program, some of the benefits are one, 
for you to see agriculture as a business and not just a farming. Two, economic development of youth, group, and cooperatives. Three, improvement of livelihood. And four, provision of livelihood for other youth. The way forward for the program aim to develop small businesses for sustainability at community level and to seek external markets. One may ask about sustainability. The plan is to utilize existing farm practices and by product development, and also use of available spaces by community and government for youth program expansion. In closing, on behalf of the Youth Affairs Division and the Ministry of All, I want to thank the Fauna Agriculture Organization, the FAO, through the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Forestry, Rural, Rural Transformation, for the opportunity provided for the youth and continued commitment for program expansion and sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Duncan. I'm now pleased to invite the Lead Technical Officer for Agribusiness Marketing in, in the Food and Agriculture Organization, Mr. Juan Shakespeare, to deliver, uh, or to describe or to, you know, the technical details of this uh, particular project. Juan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, call again. Um, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, Honorable Sabutu Cesar, Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries, Forestry, Industry, and Labor. Honorable, Honorable or Orando Brewster, Minister of National Mobilization, Social Development, Local Government, Gender Affairs, Family Affairs, Housing, and Informal Settlement. Um, P.S. Nerissa Gittens, um, Assistant Youth Officer, from the Ministry of National Mobilization, Ms. Antoinette Duncan, youth representatives from the different cooperatives and groups, colleagues, um, good afternoon to you. Um, before jumping right into the um, specifics of the project that we have at hand, I have the honor to bring you greetings on behalf of our sub-regional coordinator, Dr. Renata Clark, on our and special appreciation from our Director General, Mr. Xu Dong Yu, on the occasion of World Food Day 2021, under the theme of our actions are our future, better production, better nutrition, better environment, better livelihoods. Special word of appreciation to members for the support and the wishes of our Director General that learning and working together is the future that he wants to continue to build in our organization. He wishes you a very happy World Food Day. Um, what a better occasion to talk about youth in agriculture, to share with you this, the details of this project that we are launching, um, considering the, uh, the specifics of, of youth in our food systems. As a matter of a, of a general background, global youth between 50 and 24 years old have reached the unprecedented figure of 1.2 billion, that is 15.5% of the global population and 47% of the working age population with 85% residing in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Youth vulnerability and unfulfilled potential is three times higher, uh, and it is more likely in, than in adults. Um, it is more likely that youth be unemployed, mostly work in the informal sector and with vulnerable jobs. 22% of that youth are neither in education, do not have employment, or have access to training. The high level panel on of experts a report on promoting youth engagement and employment in agriculture and food systems indicate that it is crucial that we bring youth to this debate on more sustainable and resilient um, 
full system. Just that's as a matter of background, going right into the project that we are launching, which is Youth Eye Entrepreneurship for Rural Development um, Project, the analysis leading to, to, this, to the design of this project identifies that the youth group's concern are, uh, have challenges related to weak business capacity, to weak crop production capacity, to lack of access to irrigation, short-term or no access to lands, inadequacies of facilities used for processing, <clears throat> lack of equipment or use of viral kitchen scale equipment, limited financial capacity to contribute to or raise funds. So the project objective is very in line with these assessments and in line with the uh, context element that I have just shared with you. The project goal is to contribute to decreasing youth unemployment, underemployment and poverty related to SDG2. It aims to do this by enhancing three areas, production capacity and competitiveness of young agri-entrepreneurs by having better access to lands, facilities and equipment and seed capital and, for in, and by enhancing the capacity of project partners to actually deliver and multiply support to these youth groups. By the end of the project, we expect the country to have improved capacity to design policies and mechanisms for access of youth agribusinesses to land facilities and business development tools, young entrepreneurs that are trained to produce competitive commodities and products, and improved capacity of implementation agencies to facilitate upgrading of youth-based farms and agro-processing ventures to meet basic market standards. To that end, we will we have designed we will be implementing a suite of capacity developing actions, including in the areas of value chain development, business planning, marketing with emphasis on digital uh, marketing, uh, food safety and standards and climate smart agriculture. We are adopting an integrated approach to developing the capacity of the youth groups by simultaneously addressing these different aspects. There will be different activities being implemented in the next two years. Um, and starting today or World Food Day after this um, initial ceremony for, for the launch of the project, we will start with an introductory training on market-driven value chain development um, with participation of some youth representatives and some of the key project stakeholders. Um, with that said, I uh, give you thanks for the opportunity and um, I wish you a very happy World Food Day. Thank you, Juan. Uh, so there we have it. Uh, an indication of what the context was from the youth department and uh, an overview of the technical uh, frame of this project. Now, so thank you, Juan, for that. I would like now to invite Ms. Aronique Ballantyne, a representative of the beneficiary groups to present you know, a synopsis of expectations from the youth communities uh, regarding this project. Aronik. Okay, so Kimberly, are you going to present? Hi, good afternoon. Are you seeing me? Yes, continue. Hello? Good yes, afternoon. we're here. Go my, ahead. Name is, my name is Kimberly Francis. I am the president of IAMCO, one of the six agribusiness groups from the windward to the leeward side of the island. I in the Grand Island of Beckley. 
We strive to create an agriculture business providing unique goods and services to the people of St. Vincent and possibly worldwide. This grant will create a foundation for us to make this venture possible. We will be able to have our starting assets while we work at a business life. We would create job opportunities for others. Some of our products include vacuum packaging of provisions, seasoning, and wines, etc. Today, I would like to speak on what I would like to see as a result of the youth community. And I hope that I also speak for my fellow members as well. Oftentimes, youths are connected to their community in more authentic and unhindered ways than adults. That that can help communities better. I would like to see more activities in the community where youths can be more engaged and open with themselves and others around them. This helps to interact with adults and have guidance as they develop skills needed to make decisions and solve complex issues. Youth who are engaged in community activities at a younger age shows better problem solving and decision making skills compared to those who are not engaged. A sense of belonging and purpose is created when youth realize that their ideas and their opinions are being heard and considered. Youth develop a great effective leadership skills. Youth will also come together instead of fighting amongst each other. I would like to see less drug and alcohol use and criminal behavior in the communities. The more engaged they become, the less time they'll have to turn to these things as a way of relief or a way to pass time as they be more occupied. This benefits the community with higher academic performances, lower rates of pregnancies, lower marijuana use. I would like to see more entrepreneurs emerging from the community as this creates job opportunity and decreases unemployment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Francis. Uh, just to explain uh, the original speaker I had uh, on for Ms. Francis uh, stepped in, Ms. Kimberly Francis stepped in to present uh, that heartfelt uh, sentiment on behalf of those groups. Okay, so thank you again, Ms. Francis. And now we, we have the honor of inviting the policymakers to address us and essentially to provide a sense of comfort and confidence that this project would be supported. First, I would invite the Honorable Orlando Brewster, Minister of National Mobilization, Social Development, Local Government, Gender Affairs, Family Affairs, Housing, and Informal Settlement to address us. It's Brewster. Yes, good afternoon. And uh, thank yeah. you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Colville King, for, for that warm introduction. Uh, let me acknowledge the, the presence and of my cabinet colleague, the Honorable Saboto Caesar, the Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries, Forestry, Rural Transformation. But I also like to acknowledge Mr. Juan Chiaz, who is the Technical Officer of Trade and Marketing for the FAO Caribbean. Also the, the two PSs from the ministries involved, PS Catherine De Freitas and PS Nerissa Gittens Macmillan. Also, I would like to acknowledge the media who is here, my, my staff member, Ms. Antoinette Duncan, also the Assistant Youth Officer. I saw Mrs. Anthony also, the Director of Youth Affairs in my ministry. 
other well wishers who are here to witness the, the launch of the Youth in Agriculture Entrepreneurs. A warm and pleasant evening to you. First, let me apologize for not turning my camera on. Uh, I am on a bit of leave medically, but still I saw it fit to be a part of this wonderful initiative as we launch the Youth Agriculture Entrepreneurship for Rural Development Project. I am here this afternoon in the capacity of, as the Minister of Mobilization. And through my ministry, we, we have initiated um, a program that Ms. Duncan explained a bit earlier. And I've been integrally involved with this program and making my various checks to make sure that we are on track. And I can say that they have been doing a, an excellent job thus far with this initiative. And I'm happy to see a lot of the young persons here this evening as we witness this launch of, of, of this project. Now from the Ministry of Mobilization, uh, we, we, I have been briefed and advised of, of three budding and successful groups um, in the rural communities, um, namely Chateaubile, Bayabu, and my hometown, Leyu. And I'm happy to, to know that the rural areas are being served when it comes to the youth and their involvement in agriculture. And the government and, and this ministry, we are eager and ready to run with this project. And we know that we are gonna give it our full support. And I know it's a joint between the Ministry of Agriculture, my fellow cabinet colleague and, and Minister Caesar is also a hard worker when it comes to the Ministry of Agriculture. And I'm sure once we can put our heads together with under the leadership of the FAO, who is a part who, who's carrying this program, we are sure that the outcomes will be um, something that we will talk about for many years to come. Now, the, 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 as a minister with a responsibility for youth, I heard Mr. Chiaz mention that there is a, a high level of unemployment globally amongst the youth. And I'm happy that we are embarking in such a program that would help not only here in our country, but it would help to, to decrease the unemployment uh, of youth uh, across the globe. And agriculture, as, a, as, a, as I, I've heard before by persons, it is not one of the more upscale profession in, 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 um, in our country here, but uh, I have news for some because based on the statistics from some of the banks, the local banks here, some of the biggest savers in our banks are persons who are involved in agriculture. And I usually think time and, and mention this to the youth. And being an entrepreneur, it is not an easy task, but it is one that once you, you're determined and focused to make it work, it would come to fruition. Now, again, I would like to thank um, the FAO for being a, a very crucial part, for playing a crucial part in this project. And we are happy, um, the government of St. Vincent happy that we can partner with the FAO to make sure that our youth are meaningfully engaged. I would also like to thank the, the Ministry of Agriculture for, for, for carrying this program and also my ministry, the Ministry of National Mobilization through our youth division. I would like to thank them very much for, for, for making this, this, this program and, and what they've accomplished thus far to be a success. And I don't want to leave out anyone because I am here just basically to pledge my support and, and, and making sure that the FAO is aware that we are going to work hand in hand and heart and heart, but in our hearts together as we make sure that we help our youth across this country. So again, I, I would like to just wrap it up by saying that the, the, the Ministry of National Mobilization um, and the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we are happy to be a part of this program and we are going to try our very best to make sure that we this program is a success not only initially but we are looking for success in the future as well so thank you for having me and thank you for for allowing me to brief you on what we're doing here 
and our involvement from the Ministry of National Mobilization. Thanks much. Much obliged. Thank you, Minister Brewster, and, and the fact that you are not well, but uh, are here, you're here today indicates or demonstrates in no uncertain terms your commitment, your commitment to this project and to youth development. So thank you for those remarks and assurances. As we move along, I'd like to now invite the Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Minister Sabato Caesar, Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, Fisheries, Rural Transformation, Industry and Labor, to provide us with a feature address, essentially marking the launch uh, of this program. A champion in his own right for youth, uh, youth development and uh, agriculture development uh, as part of his portfolio specifically. So Minister Caesar, welcome. Thank you very much, Chair. I want to recognize the presence of my cabinet colleague, Dr. Brewster, permanent secretary from my ministry, different representatives here from ministries. I want to also recognize the presence of the representative from the, the FAO. One, I want to welcome you to this discussion, the organizers, the media, a blessed afternoon to all. Today is Friday 15th, and tomorrow is Saturday the 16th, World Food Day. And it's very important that in every discussion, we have a great appreciation of the role played by citizens, farmers, food producers, fishers, agro-processors, stakeholders throughout the food production value chain as it pertains to two very important issues, food security, and food sovereignty. When you address the dynamics of our population and the makeup and the composition of our population, you will recognize that there are some persons who are too young to work. There are some persons who are too old to work. And uh, between these two groups, you have what is termed as the economically active age group. And within that, you have to divide it between the workforce, which is used for the, the public sector, primarily the government, and the workforce for the private sector. And in the private sector, you should have to further divide it. The persons who are into tourism, persons who are into construction, and uh, there are many who are engaged in different services, the fashion designers, the, the man on the road who's making the baskets. And we have a percentage remaining as food producers and basically participated in the private sector aspects of the value chain for food production, again, from the private sector standpoint. So if we have a national pie of 110,000 persons and we subdivide it into those groups, then we see the percentage of persons who are involved and engaged in agriculture and uh, ancillary areas. So someone may hazard a guess that it is between persons who are directly participating, maybe under 15,000 persons, 
or actively engaged in some form of enterprise. And the question is, what percentage of that group are young? And uh, there is a definition which is used in my village as to how do you describe someone who's young? And if I ask that question in my village, someone will see at the back of the, the room, you're as young as you feel. Well, the United Nations has formalized it and they have placed youth as anyone under the age of 35. And uh, that being said, I want to use that as the, the point of departure. The theme for World Food Day has different areas that it is focusing on or actions our future. And we have to do better at production, at nutrition, the environment for a better life. And we have to focus on the youth and the role that they have played and continue, will continue to play. In 2005, when I returned to St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and I started to do some work in the, in the community, working with youth groups, we developed a, a mantra. And uh, we noted that in order for St. Vincent and the Grenadines to, to develop and to move forward as a country, as a nation, as a people, that there was a need for an exceptional cadre of multi-talented and multifaceted young persons who are not distracted by a pure inward gaze at developing self only, but have a constant reflection on enhancing the life and livelihoods of the people in their communities, because with, with stronger communities, we have stronger parishes and with stronger parishes, we have a, a better nation. And with a better nation, we have a better sub-region and region, CARICOM. And that is one of the surest way that we can bring meaningful changes to our world. So I'm very happy today to participate in this launch, Youth Agri Entrepreneurship for Rural Development. And I want to thank all the drafters and I want to single out Dr. Phillips for her hard work and dedication in ensuring that we don't only have concepts, but that she has labored throughout several weeks and months with different groups and organizations. And I want to recognize here the hardworking staff at the Department of Labor in my ministry and the Department of Youth, because this is conducted across the ministries, it's agriculture and, and youth. I want to encourage all the young persons who will benefit from this program to take it as something that is serious. We are training that cadre that will form the next generation of producers. And there are many who have gone before who have left a, a taboo. And I, I want for you to, to be aware that from the, the policy standpoint, from this government that we want to ensure that the youth in our country, that you bring to bear your knowledge and your expertise that is cutting edge as we walk towards the commercialization of food production in our country. The chair in his capacity as the, the diversification officer has always noted that agriculture is a business and must always be treated as a business. 
And in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we have many producers within the sector, but we have many traditional producers who are awaiting a marriage between many of the outdated methods of production and uh, some of the methodologies that must be employed if we are to move into a, a commercial space. With that, I want to rest. I want to wish everyone tomorrow a, a blessed World Food Day 2021. And definitely, I'm happy to know that this very important discussion about youth agri-entrepreneurship for rural development is taking place today. And I want to recognize also those who are in the meeting from the Department of Rural Transformation. May God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you. Minister Caesar, for those, for this address, for those remarks. And Yes, uh, right, so ladies and gentlemen, you've heard from all the, the, the key stakeholders, the players, from those who, would, who are in need and, and who are looking forward to the support to uh, those who would be providing technical and, and material assistance to those that are important for setting and enabling the policy framework, the incentive framework to ensure that this project is a success. You have heard about the project, you know, from the various uh, players. And having heard that, I think you can agree with me that this project embodies the world food the theme in its entirety by addressing the issue of capacity building for production system, new sustainable production systems that can improve yields and at the same time generate better livelihoods for young persons through those improved yields, but also by upgrading value chains and uh, engaging in aspects of the private sector operation that traditionally our farmers uh, have not addressed as was mentioned uh, by Minister Caesar. The project will contribute in a very practical way as a platform for strengthening youth entrepreneurship to those young persons who have demonstrated some level of commitment and interest uh, for having a career or um, livelihood in agriculture. By so do. Excuse me, there's a mic open. Okay, thank you. Right, so I was saying that the, the project provides that platform for, for supporting those young persons who embarked on a journey only a few months ago or just over a couple of years ago. By so doing, it serves as a springboard for vibrant youth agribusinesses throughout the country that multi skilled private sector oriented kind of business driven by young people. And it is worth acknowledging, particularly for the youth, that the journey that was started is now made easier because we have good company. We have good company in the form of the ministries of agriculture and national mobilization in the form of the food and agriculture organization and the other agencies that are collaborating on this project. Of course, central to this are those young persons that we wish to be meaningfully occupied and to have very high 
levels of uh, livelihood and standard of living. I think this is, those are the, the points that I picked up uh, from the presentation, presentations of the various speakers. And as we close this aspect of the activity, I'd like to welcome Mr. Azakai Edwards, again, another youth beneficiary to provide us with the vote of thanks. Mr. Edwards. Uh, with you hearing me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, could you check that your mic is not muted? We heard you initially, so you can continue. Okay, seem after this launch would be the first the inception workshop. And of course, you're free uh, to join these activities or this activity, sorry. Okay, so I'm looking for some guidance here, but I think we're having difficulty connecting with Mr. Edwards to provide a vote of thanks. So I would like to bring to an end the, this proceeding. So, and so thank, so let me thank you, thank all of you for uh, participating, for the speakers uh, in, from uh, uh, the prayer, the prayer by Ms. Stoke to Ms. Duncan, who provided us a, a background as to the, the project context, to Juan, who explained the technical de framework of the project, and then to um, Ms. Francis, who, who provided an expectation from the, the youth, to Ms. Minister Brewster, and, and particularly because he's well, but he made that significant effort to be here as well and to provide those remarks. And of course, to Minister Caesar for providing uh, those words of encouragement as well. I'd like to thank as well the various officers and uh, in, the, in the ministries of agriculture and uh, the youth department, uh, Dr. Phillips for doing a lot of the legwork because I was not as involved uh, on the, lead, the days leading up to this activity. Uh, the lead technical officer one and the FAO team for providing the backstopping for this launch and for the media for carrying uh, uh, the, the mantle in terms of distributing the information, not just now, but in, in the future, packaging the information and uh, distributing as widely as possible. Uh, the, Young, young people, the beneficiaries of this project, your participation demonstrates as well that you are fully committed to this project and we'd like to thank you for participating. So, Godspeed, God blessing as we close this session and await the FAO
to move into the next phase of the activity for this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colonel. Shall we give a few minutes for the people to depart or shall I just jump into it? I think you I should think jump. you can give a few, maybe uh, not to prolong it, but maybe a five minutes, you know, so people can stretch their legs and then we jump into it. Okay, I'll wait for your signal. Please, uh, particularly for those uh, technical and um, technical agencies and for the participant, uh, just use the opportunity to stretch your legs, but please don't leave. It is critical that we all participate in this next session. Thank you. Expired our time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colville. And uh, once again, welcome to everyone, to the project stakeholders. It is a real pressure to be today with you here. I think it is an excellent opportunity that we're using this launch, not only to, to speak about what we're going to do, uh, but to actually do it, to start doing it. Um, so we, we thought that we should not uh, let that opportunity escape. Let me go a little bit more in detail um, about a little bit of the background and uh, go again on to the objective types of activities and plan in moving forward. Um, as I mentioned, um, youth engagement in agriculture is a growing priority within FAO. Internally, we have created the Youth Committee, which was launched in 2019. It is a space where there are many resources related to youth engagement in agriculture, practices, innovations, you know, networks dealing with a lot of, a lot of good things that we can draw from. Um, there, you, there is also internally a rural youth action plan. So I like to say this, it, 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 just to note that we're not starting from zero, that there are many resources that we'll be able to pull from. Externally, we're also participating in an interagency network on youth development. In the context of uh, the high level of the Economic and Social Council, there is a youth forum that convenes to inform the high level panel forum in the context of the SDG agenda. There is also a decent jobs for youth global initiative. And there is of course, the recently created World Food Forum youth chapter. So just as a matter of background, we have all those resources at hand. Going a little bit down into um, what you should expect in terms of resources and capacity supporting the implementation of the project. From the FAO side, you would be supported uh, by the trade and markets team, uh, particularly in areas of agribusiness and value chain development. And we have today here with us my colleague, Ms. Brie Romold, who is the um, international value chain um, and rural development expert. Um, and she's gonna be after, after this introduction, leading us into an initial training on market-led value chain um, development. We'll also be mobilizing um, uh, national uh, capacities uh, and other international experts. We will be counting with the support of a national business planning consultant that will help on the ground, you know, uh, uh, the, the national, and will be part of the national team to facilitate things um, moving on. We will engage um, also an international, international business planning expert for a partial time to help us um, use and adapt existing tools on business planning, including financial planning that have been already developed in the context of a previous, previous project called Agricom. We will mobilize experts to support us and guide us in areas that have been identified as key for the development of the project, such as food safety um, and climate smart agriculture. And last but not least, we will be also engaging um, uh, uh, regional experts, young, young regional experts in this case, 
on the area of branding uh, and marketing to support you know the youth um, in, in in that area um, uh, of the products so so that's about uh, the the support that you should expect going back into the project objectives as I mentioned we would expect at the end of the project that there would be improved capacity to design policies and mechanisms for access of use agribusinesses to land, facilities, business development tools. So we want to contribute to improving the, you know, the policy, the normative framework. We also want to work at the level of the capacities, you know, and the structures in terms of having a national team from the different ministries, from the different partner agencies, enhance the capacity for upgrading youth-based farms and agro-processing ventures, some of which you know you are already engaged, some of which you will be uh, developing, et cetera. Basically with the view of meeting certain um, basic and necessary business standards as well as, well as market standards. Um, and of course, uh, the, the other aspect is working with, with yourselves, with the youth, young entrepreneurs, to train them to produce competitive commodities and products. And my colleague, Brie Ramu, will talk a bit more about what we mean by you know, being able to do that in a competitive um, way. We, we are hoping that uh, immediately after this uh, launch and introductory training, we will follow up with the focal point of the project, Mr. Colvin Kim and others, you know, to define um, and identify a cross-technical national team that will be supported by the FAO um, and national project partners to deliver on different sets of activities. Um, those sets of activities correspond to the objective that I just mentioned, you know, activities related to the support provided to agribusiness development from a policy perspective, access to lands, facilities, and online marketing, young entrepreneurs uh, training in value chain development, uh, business skills, value addition, good agriculture and climate smart practices, and training of trainers uh, from project counterparts uh, to assist, to facilitate the training and coaching of agri entrepreneurs in the various agribusiness development areas. So we would hope that that cross-sectional team at the national level would have people that are not necessarily experts, but do have some experience in working in these different areas that aim to contribute to each of the types, uh, each of the three objectives of the project. The training structure, you should expect a training program that will involve a combination of international and national support, um, the approach, it will be a blended delivery approach, you know, including virtual and in-person training sessions, uh, COVID-19 dependent, of course. Um, the program will involve um, a number of components and some tentative uh, timelines have been suggested in the concept note that was probably uh, shared with you. We will, we will seek to discuss with the focal point and with the internal team to fine tune that work plan in moving forward. We're basically, we're looking um, uh, at a number of steps involving analyzing, you know, the existing and prospective agribusiness policy and incentive framework and marketing possibilities, starting, you know, from November until the first quarter of 2022. We are starting, as soon we will be starting on rapid value chain analysis and upgrading plan, which should be concluded by February 2022. Um, we're looking at business skills training from project counterparts. As I mentioned, we will try to adjust and update, you know, existing tools and materials developed previously. Um, and we will identify and bring on board uh, the, the, the experts that will be leading on that. We will do actual skills, business skills training for the youth groups um, that would start in the second quarter of 2022. We will do the technical training in good agricultural practices, food safety, and climate smart agriculture in the second part of um, next year. Once we see that there is a, you know, a consolidation of the groups that we have adjusted the materials, um, uh, that we have you know, all the inputs that we need to actually you know, uh, deliver on those other technical areas. Um, and we will have, uh, once we have tested that, training, you know, we hope to have a second round of business skills training 
for youth groups in um, 2023. So we'll, we'll seek to develop a detailed plan for the first year, you know, from now on, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. Uh, of course, all training activities, you know, will be targeted, but of course, will be open to other interested staff within the Ministry of Agriculture and other partner agencies or the private sector. Um, the concept now is there. Um, it has been or will be distributed to all uh, stakeholders and those interested. And with that introduction, I would like uh, to invite my colleague, Ms. Brie Rumol to lead us into this initial training session on value chain, market-oriented value chain development. Over to you, Brie. Okay, thank you very much, Juan. Um, good afternoon, everyone, uh, in particular, the honorable ministers, the permanent secretaries who are still here, and of course, our ministry counterparts, uh, Mr. King and Dr. Phillips, lovely to see you this afternoon. Uh, as Juan said, my name is Bree Rommelt. I am working for the FAO in the area of developing um, competitive and resilient value chains with a particular emphasis on agribusiness and finding the right opportunities for our farmers in the region. Um, it's my pleasure to be here working with you in particularly for a youth focus project. I think it's a great opportunity and I'm looking forward to, to working with the whole team moving ahead. Um, as Juan mentioned, uh, we're opening or making the use this afternoon of this time together to actually get on into it, um, to, to move, to take the opportunity to, to discuss and, and start some initial or introductory trainings that will at least give you an overview of what you can expect in the process moving forward. Um, so I encourage everybody here today, particularly the representatives from the youth who are really here for um, is to get involved. We, I really want this to be an interactive session as much as possible to show you and give you a feel for our hands-on and more applied approach that we really want to work together with you um, as much as possible on the ground to find the markets, find the products um, and, uh, and, and get going. Um, just before I begin or commence the training, I am just going to hand back over to Juan, who I imagine has one more aspect to address. Yes, thank you, Brie. Um, I emphasize about you know the diversity of uh, players and capacities that will be behind this project, and I like to to recognize you know some important players that are today with you with us. Um, the representative from the Center for Enterprise and Business Development, the Bureau of Standards and the community college are present. They will be key partners, you know, in helping us, you know, implement the project and also in ensuring that whatever we develop, you know, can potentially be expanded beyond uh, the duration of the project. Um, thank you for being here with us. Uh, over to you again, Brie. Okay, thank you, Juan. And, and I too would like to extend my welcome and thanks to the representatives of the Center of Business Development, the Bureau of Standards, of course, and the college, which are extremely important partners. Um, okay, so uh, as mentioned, I'm, I'm a value chain expert. So the focus today's training is really going to be on value chains and how to identify those products with the greatest market potential. This isn't, we will do it with um, the youth groups more hands-on and together, but this is just to get you, give you a feel for what we are going to do today. As I was mentioning, I'm hoping it can be an interactive session. So where possible, um, please do make use of the chat function because I'll be asking you a number of quiz questions um, to get your feedback and thoughts on, on the way forward. So please be generous with the use of the chat functions as well. And, and if you would like to make some comments or respond directly, I have no problems with you jumping in and miking and, and sharing your opinions. After all, this is um, an interactive session and we're here to, to learn together. So bear with me as I open up my presentation and we shall begin. Okay. So as Juan mentioned, there's a number of different components. Uh, as Juan and Mr. King actually mentioned, there's a number of different components for this value, for this project um, from uh, online marketing, business planning, production and whatnot. But to start with, we're working on value chains because before you narrow down and, and develop all the marketing tools you need for your product, 
it's a good opportunity to first take a step back and work out what value chains um, are most advantageous for you to participate in, to be involved in, which ones have the best market opportunities, which ones have space and, and unfilled markets. Um, and then also, once you've figured out your product, to better understand your supply chain. What are the weaknesses in your supply chain? How can you strengthen them to make sure that you're delivering the right product to the right market at the right time? So with that, and I'm gonna move us in, and I was very pleased and very happy to hear the minister speaking about agriculture as a business. It absolutely is. Um, there's good revenues to be made in agriculture and uh, so many opportunities to interesting business models, interesting innovation, whether it's in the field, online, or in processing goods. So I'm very much supportive of the idea that we need to, to sell agriculture as a really interesting and viable um, uh, employment opportunity for our youth. Okay, so just to walk you through a little bit what we're going to do, and this is largely going to follow or be the flow of my the training today, is this is how we tend, how FAO approaches um, really identifying good um, business orientation to, uh, towards agriculture. First step one, choose your value chain wisely. Okay, which agricultural products have the best market opportunities for the country, for a cooperative, or for you as an individual farmer? If you can identify that, half the hard work is done. After you know which products and which value chains you are, you're going to focus on, we then want to understand and assess your supply chain or the nation's value chain to better understand where the current weaknesses are, where the critical constraints are that are the bottlenecks in the chain, because we want to focus our time and attention on releasing or alleviating those bottlenecks or those problems so that your business or the value chain, the national value chain can run more smoothly and move products much more easily to market. After we've identified some preliminary problems, we can then work towards more of the business planning. And this is where my expert colleagues in the business planning field will join, um, will join the project later on once we've established the first two steps. And of course, with every good um, business plan, we need to assess both the technical components, so how well to produce your yield rates, your production techniques, alongside the finance. How much is it gonna cost you? What is the establishment cost? And what is the market, what's the market price? And what are revenues are we talking about? The money is king and the money is important and it can be done. So we're going to show you and work with these youth groups on how to develop useful business plans to help them strategize better. And then finally is actually in implementing your business plan, your supply chain plan. Um, and this is where the project will be lending a number of integrated support um, to our young agripreneurs to um, help them in getting their businesses up and running. All right, so let's start with a quiz. And again, I remind you, please use the chat function. I don't want to be the only one speaking. Um, but just to loosen us up a little bit on a Friday afternoon before the weekend, um, and to get you thinking along value chain lines. How would you best describe an agricultural value chain? That is the first question. Answer number one, farm to farm gate, two, farm to fridge, or three, farm to fork. Please, I'm gonna give you a minute to, to put your answers in the chat box so we can get a bit of dialogue. I can see what everybody's thinking. Or if you want to call out directly, I also welcome that. Answer one, two, or three. Please don't be shy. We are a big, we're a big group of people. Farm to fridge, I see one response. Number two, does everyone agree on two? Someone out here, farm to farm gates. Okay, number one. Two, we've got that's a popular three, three. Good. I like the interaction. It's a bit of a it's a bit of a tricky question. I'll try to there to skip you up, but I can see now in the chat box the consensus is three, and that is correct. We are moving from farm right through to fork. Fork, of course, is the consumer representing the, the farm product going all the way down to eating. Farm to farm gate is just looking at the farm level and doesn't take into consideration all the processing and value addition and money that can be earned from transporting products, value putting value added to them, marketing them in strategic ways before they even get to the consumer. Farm to fridge isn't too bad, it's not too far off, but really the colloquial term for value chains is farm to fork. All right, question number two. 
Who, in your opinion, is the most important actor in the value chain? Is it A, uh, the processor, uh, A, the farmer, B, the processor, C, the supermarket, or D, the consumer? Again, go ahead, th throw it out there. What do you think? Who is the most important actor in a value chain? Is it the farmer producing the goods? Is it the processor cleaning, processing, adding value to it? Is it the supermarket? That's how you're going to get your goods if you're not visiting the supermarket. We've got a mixed bag. I've got a lot of A's. I see some D's. Anybody else want to throw in some last minute thinking? A, a is very popular. A. <laughs> in fact, it's a bit of a trick question. Everybody's important, but really at the end of the day, the most important actor in a value chain is the consumer. Um, because if there is no, what happens if you produce all your oranges and there is no one there to buy them or consume them, right? Without a consumer to purchase and take your production, there is no point producing. So while the farmer is very, very important, there is no point producing unless um, you are producing for the market. So that really underscores our emphasis in this project is we are really market orientated. If there is a market, let us produce. If there is not a market, let's look elsewhere for production, okay? We produce based on the market. So the answer is D. Oh, nearly skipped that one. Question three, and this is the last question for this quiz. Which value chains do you think tend to be the most successful? Now, number A is a production push. A production push value chain means when young farmers, they go forward and they produce a crop, maybe it's lettuce, maybe it's yam, maybe it's a fruit crop. And then once they have produced it, they then go and try and find a market to sell to. That's what we call production push. You produce first and then you try and push it off the farm. Other answer, possible answer is B, and that is a market pull. A market pull means when a young father, farmer first goes to the market first, he talks to his supermarket or down, down the road and asks what products are they missing? What products do you need more of? What products are interested in selling? And then based on that information, they come back and they then produce what they can, but based on the market. So <laughs> I see, uh, now I'm looking in the chat box and I see some very strong results for B. Yes, it is clearly market pull. This is the best way to produce. If you know your market, it's very easy to sell your produce. It's much harder to produce um, products. Um, agricultural products and then be really challenged on where to sell them to because it's stressful you may as a farmer may not be so great at marketing so it's harder to find where the markets are and then it can end in wastage so really we need to do our homework first find our markets and then help our youth groups help our ministry guide our youth groups to to working on um, how to then produce the products that the local or international market want all right, thank you for joining in on our first quiz. We have some more, um, not so much quizzes, but exercises later on, a little bit more challenging, but I think that gives you a flavor and I can see there's a good understanding of what a value chain is, which is great. So a value chain approach means that instead of looking just at production um, and just at farming, because as we've heard from all the speakers prior to me, there are so many more other functions involved in agriculture than just farming. There's a whole lot of different activities. So the value chain approach wants to look at the whole chain, right from production, right through to the consumer and look at every stage in between to work out whether A, there are some agribusiness opportunities here at the processing level or maybe even at the distribution level in addition to the farm level because farming is so much more than just, um, product, uh, agriculture is so much more than just farming. So we like to look at the whole chain and each chain is very dependent on the next as the product flows from production to harvest to transport to processing and so along. So they're all interlinked steps. And a value chain or a, a supply chain, a business supply chain will only ever be as strong as its weakest link. All right. So if you have one weak link here, say your production is weak, you're not producing using the right good agricultural practices, you have a disease spread or something happens to your fields or everybody's fields in the country, then it is gonna impact your entire chain. The processors won't have oranges to source for their juices. Um, the markets won't have any or fresh oranges to sell um, in the market. So it will have ricochet effect across um, the value chain. Similar, if you have a problem at harvesting transport, you can have a great field, a great bumper crop. 
but then there's some problems with harvesting or transport that for some reason transport isn't moving around the island to collect um, collect crop at the right time then this is going to have problems for everybody it is going to have problems for your farmers it is also going to impact your processes and your markets all right so everything is interlinked finally and coming back to the first quiz question or the second quiz question is if you have no markets, if for some reason suddenly everybody stops buying oranges, um, they the market drops out, the buyer no longer wants to stack oranges because he's not selling them. For whatever reasons, if the markets fall out um, or a competitor comes in and, and supplies oranges to the supermarket at a much cheaper price than you can, then it is going to affect your whole chain. The whole chain will go down. All right. That is why we take a market led approach, because this is very important. If you know this well, you can coordinate your whole supply to meet the market, optimize your market and your revenues. But if you don't keep an eye on the market, it's gonna affect everyone and everybody's profit along the chain. So, right. Now, how do we build this? This value chain approach has a similar impact, a similar approach as to building a strong value, a strong supply chain. So if you're an agribusiness, a youth cooperative, um, there's many, many things you need to take into consideration, just like a national value chain. At the farming level, are you using the best production techniques? Where are you getting your set planting material? Is it good quality? What is your cost of production? How much does it actually cost you to do a cycle of oranges, right? Do you know these? Moreover, when you, once you harvest, are you applying good post-harvest techniques so that you're not losing um, parts of your yield um, simply to, due to bad mistakes and, and then losing out on revenues that you could be from selling those, that, um, those oranges? Are you harvesting based on the schedule that the market wants or are you just harvesting willy-nilly as you see fit and then finding the markets, all right? When you think about your business, you could also think, does it make business sense to you as an agripreneur to add value to your product before you sell it, to make it into a powder, to an oil, to do something beyond just selling it as a raw material? Does it make financial sense? Because it will also cost you more to start converting your product into a secondary product. So have you run the numbers? And how is the best processing and storage methods to get your product um, through the value chain? Have you thought about that? If you sell your product to a, to a processor, how do you negotiate good terms with your processor? And how do you, how do you negotiate a long-term relationship so they're a reliable supplier? What food safety requirements do you need to adhere to? Um, how will you package your product? Does it look good? And what, does, what sort of packaging does your buyer want? When does he want the um, package to arrive at the store? And what type of, what different buyers are there in the market? Which ones are likely to give you the best returns? Um, and, and what are their requirements? How much volume do they want? What price do they want? How do they want it arriving in store? When do they want it arriving in store? All of these questions are challenging and what agripreneurs really sort of have to think through step by step. At a national level, we also look at this for the, for the national value chain, but it is also very much applicable to every agripreneur. So once we do this kind of value chain thinking, you think through your whole supply chain, we can then start working out where you're having your biggest challenges, all right? Is it food safety? You really don't know what the food safety requirements are. Your processing facilities aren't in good nick. We need to work on that part of the chain. Otherwise, everything is moving okay. Or is your, do you have major issues at the production level? No matter how you apply the techniques, it's not quite working. So we need to look at different sides of where you're having issues to understand, we don't need to work on all of these areas. Some of them are working well. Let's focus on the areas that you're struggling with the most um, and then and come up with a strategy to build a business, a stronger business plan around the weak areas. All right, so again, similar to a national value chain for an entrepreneur supply chain, if you, have, if you have a problem here with your buyers, it's going to affect every stage of production and, and likely the way back. So the value chain approach, we think, is a very useful way to start looking at a youth, the youth to start thinking of. And as um, the speaker earlier today said, yes, if there's some complexity. We need to help work with our young um, entrepreneurs on how to think through these steps to, to put all the pieces together to come up with great business plans. Okay, so the final thing I would say about the value chain approach and why we do value chain assessments is because we all have our area of specialty and our tech, you know, technical area. 
um, or our areas of interest for, for young people as well. If you're interested in farming in particular, or you're more interested in the marketing side, we always tend to have our, our technical preferences. As a result, when we look at national value chains or when we look at our own supply chain, perhaps, we tend to be a little bit blinkered. We tend to see, see things from where we stand. If I'm an expert in irrigation, I'll tend to look at farming practices and I visit our farmers and I see them just how they're managing their irrigation. If I'm in the policy unit, I tend to be much more understanding the bigger um, regulations and policies and planning initiatives of the, of the government, for example. Or if I'm if an export um, promotions agency, I'm really looking at the markets, but with an export orientation. So what actually often happens is that we all tend to be working in our own offices or in our own farms without much a bigger sight of the bigger picture. The value chain approach aims us as we work together to realize that we are all looking at the same thing. And unless we work at this, we all work together and look at the same thing together, we aren't going to be able to move the sector alone. So irrigation itself will not improve the cassava sector. Um, you know, a, a great policy and regulation won't move or change the export potential of, of, of certain crops. Okay, so we need to bring our expertise together, whether that's at, at the ministry level or also um, at the at the at the planning level. So um, at the business level, so with our different entrepreneurs bringing together their different areas of expertise in the cooperative to, to work together to build um, a great plan. And through that approach, when we start seeing the bigger picture together, as well as the details, that is where we really get something running. So we need to move away from this ad hoc planning and move towards a more holistic systems approach. Okay, so let us get now about a bit more back to um, some questions and some challenges. Um, I want to start now with value chain selection. I said we had a four step process, but I want to start back at the very first one, which to me is the most important. If you choose the right product, everything else becomes much easier. So you can see four products on your screen in front of you. And I want you to add in the um, chat box, albeit I forgot to put A, B, C, and D, but let's say this is A, B, C, and D. Please let me know which one of these products you think has the greatest market potential. And let's say in St. Vincent. Is it cassava? I see someone saying honey. Does anyone think honey, strawberries, uh, tomatoes, honey? Honey is popular, that's good. Which one do you have, think has the biggest market potential? Now, we, when we talk about potential, um, we're looking at the size of the market, like how many tomatoes does the local population want to eat? How much um, cassava, do, uh, fresh cassava, does the country want to eat? Does the export markets want to eat? Or how much um, processed cassava flour as well does the country want to eat? So it's not just fresh products, but we also want to think about the um, value added potential. So I see here in the chat box B is tomatoes is, is quite popular, honey and um, tomatoes. People haven't really said much about cassava or strawberries. That's okay. All right. All right. There's no rule. If let's take to the next question. If I give you this information, which of these products has the greatest market potential? Does this change your opinion about the, uh, about the answer? about your answer, Does you, do you shift your opinion, all right? By this, I've added here, we actually sort data, all right, to actually know, find out the sales of each um, product and we're able to quantify it. So we're able to bring some proper evidence to the table and this is the backbone of a value chain approach. We wanna work with the real numbers and the real data to make our decisions, not just on um, anecdote and opinion. So now let's see the size of the market. Obviously, cassava is a much larger market Tomatoes is a bit smaller, honey is a bit smaller again, and strawberries is a bit small. Tomato, someone's saying tomato now. Do you, have you changed your opinion to what you originally thought? For those who said honey, are you still going to stand by honey? You still think that's got the biggest market potential? Would you get into honey production based off this data? All right. So for the final sheet on this exercise, I'm gonna show you another graph. We're gonna add even more data or more um, information to help you choose your crop in a more informed way, all right? Now you'll see two circles around each. Um, okay, I like that. <laughs> um, 
I'll see two circles here now. Now, where the circle is solid, that is basically the size of the market that farmers are currently supplying. So farmers say, for example, this is hypothetical, but tomatoes in, say, tomato farmers are able to fill and sell 50 metric tons. However, the full market, annual market wants 100 metric tons. Okay, so that means there's all this space here that the farmers, that local farmers have not been able to fill. This is empty demand. So supply does not equal demand. So instead here, we're not just looking at how much um, of a one crop uh, the country is producing, but we're also trying to understand how much is the country demanding and what is the difference between um, what we currently supply plus what we, the market wants supplied. All right, so this final sheet, now when you see two circles and you see more information in front of you, does your decision change? Do you still think honey has the biggest potential, market potential for you to get into honey production, for example? I would love to see some um, comments or just to let me know if you changed your mind in the chat box, because this is what I'm curious. As we add more information to your decision, does it more information, does it help you change your decision or not? Okay, so what we can see here is that we have a number of different, a number of different products. Um, I see some people have changed and some people have switched back to honey, that's great. All right, so what we can see here is that although there may be say, strawberries might be the smallest overall demand, it's currently the least filled. So there's a lot of consumers wanting to buy strawberries in the country, they just can't find them. So to me, this represents an excellent market opportunity. Okay. Similarly here, we, honey also has great market potential that's unfilled, right? And tomatoes is not too bad because you could also get in, there's unfilled market here. Cassava, we can see the country is managing to supply more, most, almost most of its um, demand for cassava. So when we talk about selecting markets, it's not simply what you can grow in your fields. It's not simply does um, the St. Vincent's eat more cassava than strawberries and therefore I'll, make, I'll grow cassava. When we do market assessments, we really want to understand what is the difference between what is demand and supply? Is the country, are the farmers in the country producing enough to meet demand? And if not, how big is the gap? Because the gap there is the opportunity. That's when you can go to the market and say, I have here a basket full of honey. Do you want to buy it? And the consumer's are like, yes, I've been looking for honey for ages. Yes, I will buy it and I'll pay a good price for it. So we really want to find those products where the demand and the market opportunity is significantly high. Okay, thank you for participating. Um, we have, FAO has a, a developed a new tool, as Juan was mentioning, we have a number of different tools that we can and will roll out in this project to help our agripreneurs and to help our ministry counterparts in identifying which products are the best, um, have the best demand conditions. And by demand, we're really assessing whether there's local demand, what the export demand is, is the market growing? Um, you know, there's, there's big markets now for CMOS and Moringa and all these like high coconut and these products are getting like health fads. Is the market growing or is it shrinking or is it staying the same? Because this is important for the future. It's also important to look at the profitability, look at the farm, the cost of production and the farm gate price. Is it a profitable crop? Because that's also important for farmers to consider when they choose their, their products. And what about value added profitability? You know, can you make products, additional value added products that can earn you more money? So we're gonna, we look, we have a tool that looks at all of these components. And in addition to demand, we also need to look at supply because of course you can't grow everything um, on your farm because of the agroecological conditions. So we also wanna look at whether it's possible to grow, whether you're gonna get good yield rates, what kind of technology you would need to do to use to be able to get good um, returns on your investment, what sort of support is available in terms of extension support, um, are you exposed to much risk? Is it a risky crop to grow in terms of pest and disease or climate change? Um, and how much coordination is going on um, between the farmers and, and the sector. So value chain selection, we hope is going to be a little bit easier um, and what we would like to embark on with you to better assess it. And I have these pictures here in the corner to show you that this is, we have to do this together. There's not just um, data that you can put through a machine and it calculates which 
chain or which products are the best for um, different farmers in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. But really, we need to work through it. We need to look at the different factors. We need to discuss and we need to consider. So it's a very applied and participatory process. Then the results, and this is hypothetical, okay? So we've done this for a few countries now. We have yet to do it with St. Vincent. We look forward to it. Um, but I, I'm not showing you the other countries' data just yet because it's not finalized, but this is a hypothetical. So once we go through this step one of selecting which products have good opportunities, uh, we can start working out where there might be better crops to select over others. We look at two things. First, of course, the market opportunities, which is very important. So the higher the market opportunities, and by opportunities, I'm really meaning the gap between what the market, what is currently supplied to market and the gap between how much the gap between supply and demand. If there's a big gap between supply and demand, we have excellent high market opportunities. If the country is largely farmers are currently already supplying what the market wants, then the market opportunities are low. All right. Alongside the market opportunities, we're also looking at supply side readiness. So it's the intersection of um, supply and demand. If, um, if the supply side is ready to go, this, it's good soils, good climatic conditions, um, good yield rates, good uh, ministry support, then this is an excellent, it gives us an indication that this, the supply side or the production side is ready to go. So ideally, we want to kind of find the crops that lie somewhere high and high for both the market and the supply side readiness. Not to give up on all the others, but for, for various reasons, for pest and disease issues, for low market opportunities, for example, the different crops are scattered um, at different segments. So really, for, particularly for young entrepreneurs, we want to hit, pardon the pun, but get the lowest hanging fruit and help them get into market um, profitably as soon as possible. All right, so just to wrap up this part, uh, we have a few steps for those who will be involved in working with us in the process and hopefully working with us to do a number of these activities. We can figure out which markets have the greatest potential by using this market survey that we FAO Caribbean has developed to identify the high potential value chains. We mostly do that with the ministries. We also like to identify good market partners. So that's buyers, particularly for youth groups, is to figure out which buyers nearby them could be excellent partners um, in developing a more long-term and stable linkage. Um, and this will differ from youth group to youth group, depending on where you are in the islands or where um, who your closest markets are. And of course, different aspects in terms of cost of production and, and, uh, and all those sort of things. We also will run buyer surveys, so how to interview buyers to really understand what it is they want from a farming community so that you can make sure the youth group is able to produce as best as possible to what the, the buyer wants. Um, and then we, of course, we're going to look at all of these um, aspects together. So it's really the intersection between market opportunity and supply side feasibility. Okay. So that is a quick summary on step one. Um, after we do a bit more work and help select great markets to get into, we also wanna look at supply value chain assessments. Um, and this is where things get interesting as well. How strong is your value chain and where exactly are the weaknesses? So some questions, and this I want you to respond to in the chat box again, please. Based, uh, what is the answer? What is the biggest problem in the cassava value chain? We have four problems listed out here that have been identified. Um, number A, well, letter A, poor farming practices, which is decreasing yields. That has been identified as a critical issue in the cassava value chain. Second is profiteering of the middleman who is charging high prices, low prices from farmers and selling at a high price. So this is reducing what the farmer is earning from his crop. C, an outbreak of a of cassava virus that is devastating some of the farmer fields. Or D, wastage of the product on market shelves because no one is buying the product. In your opinion, put it in the chat. What do you think, which one of these do you think is the biggest problem that this value chain faces? Okay, I see some Bs, the profiteering. I see some Ds, Bs again. All right, a C, that's good. So we can see a bit of a combination. The profit middleman is definitely a problem. Wastage is an issue I can see. Um, the outbreak of the virus. 
No one saying A? Okay, that's interesting. B, yes, a, that's a good comment, a lack of creativity for the use of the product. So we're not being creative enough in terms of adding value. Yes, I think you might have found, uh, Colleen, an additional problem in the chain, which is good. Okay, so let me answer this question by telling you that they're all problems, but when we do value chain analysis or supply chain analysis, we're really trying to identify which is the most critical problem, that if we do not solve this problem immediately, um, then the whole value chain is going to suffer, all right? So in that reason, it's not A, because poor pharma practices is a problem. However, it's if, if we don't fix this problem tomorrow, the, far, the value chain will still continue. Farmers will still produce and sell, but it's just not as um, effectively or as efficiently as they can. So it is a problem, but it's not a major binding problem is what we like, the terms we used to say, all right? If there's profiteering at the middleman, we don't like it, we understand that, but the value chain continues, even if, if farmers are not earning as much as they can. They're, they're a bit angry and frustrated, but the value chain continues. Outbreak of a virus is a little bit more problematic because if it touches enough fields, then the whole supply base will collapse. And if the supply collapse, the chain will collapse. All right. So that is a little bit more concerning, but only if it's touching on 80 to 90% of farmers, because if some farmers have got the virus, but other farmers are managing to produce okay, that means the value chain will continue to stand because they'll, be, they'll produce less but there'll be still product flowing from the farms to the markets. D to me is the most concerning because if you see wastage on the shelves of products, that means the demand is not there. No matter how much you produce of the cassava, if people are not buying it or you're not finding alternative uses for it, like um, a value added products out of cassava or you're not finding export markets to take up the additional produce, there is no pro pro then we have a problem for production. All right, the value chain will really falter because if, if farmers can't sell their product, if they're selling it at a very low price, what happens? They lose money, they become less interested in producing and as businessmen, they get out of the sector. So that the, the problem of the virus and the low demand or demand issues is the biggest concern for this value chain. So if this was, if, if this was the assessment we did, we know that for our work ahead, we really want to focus as much as possible on these two issues. Although they're all problems, the, 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 the chain can still manage with these. It's still alive, but with here, it's really under threat. So this is the, these would be the areas that we work on. All right, so that was an example of sometimes we have a tendency to see uh, just what lies beneath uh, above the surface, all right? We know, we would have seen that there was problems with the middleman. We would have seen that there's problems on the markets, but we didn't really have the time to investigate what it is that's really the root cause, okay? So the value chain analysis allows us to see the symptoms, um, but then also take a greater look and really look at what are the root problems of this value chain? Which areas do we really need to focus our limited resources on and, and, um, and address? And this could also be with the supply chain, all right? So a cluster supply chain to really figure out what the main problems of the, their supply chain is. So I put this cartoon up here because I think it illuminates the point quite well that um, Sometimes if you don't look at the patient properly, and in this case, it's a value chain, if you're not looking at the patient as you're diagnosing it, you may get the wrong diagnosis. And then your surgery or your intervention will be focused on the wrong part of the system. So for example, this man here does have high cholesterol. However, his high cholesterol is not gonna kill him right now like his arrows are. Okay, so while we do need to address his our cholesterol at some point, our real focus should be on um, healing these immediate wounds right now so that he can live another day so we can then tackle the cholesterol. All right, so it's like understanding your value chain, prioritizing the main constraints and really attending to the most urgent issues straight away. All right, I'm gonna give you a bit more of a complicated um, question. So have a go, all right. 
I'll explain this slowly. Sometimes I use the analogy that a value chain is kind of like a river. It's like floating down the river on a boat from one side to the other. Because when we produce products, we really want them to flow. We want them to flow through, pro, uh, through production, out to the transport guys, um, to, the, to the agro processing businesses and through the processing business to the supermarkets, um, and then finally the consumer, right? And like any good river, the more consistent and the more open and wide it is, that means the more product we can push through the value chain, the more product that goes through a value chain, the more people can earn, the more farmers can sell, the more earnings they can take home. So we, we like that our stream, so to say, is running smoothly as possible with as little problems as, as, they, as possible. However, as you can see on this river, it's not exactly smooth sailing. So I'm going to ask people, can you tell me where are the constraints or where are the challenges in this value chain, in this river? What do you think are um, a problem that this value chain group needs to take into consideration as they float down the river? Type it into the chat box, which, what, where can you see a problem that this boat, boating group will experience as they float down the river? Everyone's a bit shy now, not as, it's not as easy. Okay, so sweet, there we go. Thank you. Um, yes, we have a few coming in now. That's good, thank you. Yes, someone's identified the sweepers and the strainers. Yes, this doesn't look nice. I wouldn't want to run into this in a boat. Um, undercut bank, yes. Thank you, that's also, that's also an issue here, absolutely. That's a concern I'd be a bit worried about if I was going down this river. Anybody else? Any other thoughts? The sandbar? Yes, sandbar. Where is the sandbar? There it is over here. Exactly, the eddy. Thank you. None of these. This actually looks like a bit more dangerous river than I would imagined when I set sail on it. And the stump field as well. Excellent. This doesn't look friendly either. Okay, good. What you've essentially done is identified the constraints in this value chain. We have them here. We have boulders you have to be aware of. There's the undercut banks. There's the eddy. There's the stump field. There is a lot of constraints. Yep. My question to you now is which of these constraints that you can see in this chain is the absolute binding constraint, is the most problem, the most critical, the most challenging constraint that you can see? Right, because we can see a lot of challenges, and that's often with the value chain. We can often see a lot of challenges. The question, though, which is the binding challenge, which is the binding constraint? Have a go, have a look to really think that if so, for example, I'm going to give you an example here. If we thought it was the wing dams, right, we could still spend a lot of time and money removing the wing dams, but then our boat would set stale and it would hit straight into the sweepers anyway. All right, so it doesn't matter if we remove this, we're still gonna hit another problem. All right, and then we'll keep going through. So which of these is the binding constraints? I see the rapids. A few people have said the rapids. Does anybody else wanna have a guess? Rapids is not correct. There's another more concerning constraint. There we go. The dam, absolutely. Colville has identified it, that is it. And dare I ask to put Colville on the spot and tell us why, um, why you think the dam is the most pressing constraint here? Why does this one concern you the most? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm no expert on rivers. <laughs> <laughs> you have a dam spill you're aware. Essentially, um, those are blockages. So no matter if you get away from the wing dams, the boulders, etc., when you get to that point, you cannot proceed. And uh, so, you know, if you, so a dam, for example, is a pretty high thing. If you drop over there, probably you're going to die. Um, <laughs> a way would block you from moving forward and so on. So I, I think that provides a binding constraint. Mm -hmm. You absolutely can't get by. Based on the design of those things. 
That's absolutely correct, Colville. And I think you said it very well as a non-river expert that uh, we can spend a lot of time and money trying to get rid of these different aspects or constraints, but still when we float down, we're gonna hit the dam. So no matter what improvements and great impact we have here, the value chain is still blocked, all right? So the question that I have to the group is, well, where do we focus? What should we, what is our leverage point? What is the key area of this chain that we should be focusing on having identified the binding constraint? Do you think we should be focusing on the wing dams? Do you think we should be focusing on the eddy? Do you think we should be focusing on the dam? Everyone's gonna be a bit nervous to, add, to answer, that's okay. Yes, the dam, well, the dam is a difficult part to intervene in, but it is, is the point. There is no point fixing other parts of this value chain unless we fix this. So what we like to say is this exercise of identifying A, constraints, and then binding constraints, or to find the most urgent critical constraint, is it's very useful because it, we know exactly where we need to intervene or spend most of our time. It helps us really, um, yeah, it makes us really focus on the area that is really the biggest problem. Yeah, and I agree. Thank you to everyone who's added comments now. Yes, we need to focus on the dam. Once this has been removed and the, and the river is flowing nicely, then we can take our time and start improving here and all the different rapids and boulders and dam, wing dams, all right? So it's the same with any value chain. You don't, there's no point focusing on the wrong end of the chain when actually the bigger problem's down at the market end. We wanna find out where the biggest problem is and spend our time on that alleviate that or improve it. And then we can start and shift our focus in other places. So thank you very much for participating. That was a bit more of a complicated one, given I'm taking you to a water analogy there. Let me give you, let's put into practice one more time. All right. So here is another diagram. This is more about a, a diagram of a value chain. Here you can see inputs, then to production, to aggregation, to processing, to distribution, to consumption. All right. So the product is the potatoes, for example, are flowing through here, through here. We have a number of constraints here. The constraints here are represented by this, all right? This, this dent in the, in the supply chain, because here we've got good volume flowing through here, then suddenly it's like a jam through the river. It gets, there's a backlog and a bottleneck here because uh, the, the sides aren't as wide anymore. So this slows the flow down, all right? Then it comes back up and then it goes down further through the value chain, but hits another constraint here and it slows the flow again. This isn't good because ideally we'd be working, we'd be flowing nice and evenly across the whole way, no problem. So the farmers can sell and get enough, as much as their produce through the chain as possible. So my question to you, which is a bigger, which is the binding constraint in example number one? Is it A or is it B? Answers in the chat, B, someone straight off the punch there. Do you think the, the binding constraints are the biggest, the most urgent constraint in this value chain? Is it A or is that B? Okay, I've got a bit of both, a bit of both. Yeah, that's good. Okay. All right, consensus I can see now is leading to B. And you're correct. This is the bigger constraint, okay? And that is really because simply this such, it's a bigger size, yeah? It's much, much larger, which means um, as product goes through here, it, it slows the flow a little bit. By the time it gets to here, the flow is slowed significantly, all right? So this is our really big bottleneck. So B is the area we wanted we want to take a look at and figure out how to come up with solutions more closely. All right, next one, example two. This is a bit more complicated, a bit more challenging here. We can see it looks a bit different. What do you reckon? Which is the biggest binding constraint here? Is it C or D? You might want to take into consideration the different sizes. Um, and give you an example that sometimes this is just a group of farmers on one side of the island, for example, producing together. 
Yeah, and they produce, produce, aggregate and process separately, but then it comes in and, and joins together with the other farmers who are producing their produce on the other side of the island and it rejoins again at distribution to finally get to the market. Okay, we've got some interesting, okay, so some D so far. D, I would love to ask you, why does anybody, is anyone brave enough to unmute and explain a little bit of your thinking as to why D might be the bigger constraint? Okay, that, well, there's an answer. The D, the flow is narrowing the process. Yes, okay. All right, well, sorry to admit, but it's actually C. All right, because while, if you can see closely, the, the constraints are about the same size. However, the constraint here is on a value chain or a production where there's much less production. So this is, um, it's a constraint, it's a problem, but it's having much less impact because there's less product flowing through here. This is our bigger value chain. And you can see here that a lot um, more is flowing through here. So when we hit an obstacle, this obstacle is having a much bigger impact on the overall chain simply because there's more tomatoes or potatoes flowing through this value chain, right? So which one would we want to work on first? If we are the ministry, for example, or this is our supply chain, which area should take our focus first of all? Should we be focusing on D or should we focus on C to improve? Similarly, I will say that C, if C is our biggest problem, let's address C. Yeah, thank you very much. So C, because if this is my business and this is one flow of my one, one business, see this is my potato business going up here my, and my um, tomato business going down here. And I can see that C is a small constraint, but it's on my main chain or my main product, then this will concern me as a businesswoman. All right, so I wanna tackle this one first to make sure my potatoes are flowing smoothly to the market. And then once this is looking better, I will then shift here to address the issues at tomatoes. All right, good. I can see that everyone agrees with me on C. I appreciate that. So lucky last, <laughs> just to give you a bit more of a challenge to, to tweak your head a bit more. Which of these constraints, E or F, is the binding constraint in this value chain? Which is the bigger problem for your business or for the national industry? Is it at E or is it at F? This one's a bit challenging because you can see again, similar to the top, we have a smaller value chain here, maybe one product, a smaller product moving along here. And then we have much more product moving on this chain, but we can see that one is going, you are selling to the local market and one product is being sold to the export market. I see a few Fs, okay, F seems very popular. There's one E, good, I like a bit of, ah, okay, good. Does anyone want to explain why, either by unmuting or um, typing in the chat? Thank you very much. The chain is completely cut off at S. Yes, the chain, the chain stops. In fact, it doesn't flow. So my, if this is my potato line, it's not actually even making it to the market because there's a big gap here. Yes, okay. So the question I have now is which one of these, if this is my business or this is the national value chain, which one should we be focusing on improving E or F? E, F, I see a, a few different opinions. ERF, anybody else want to have a have a go before I tell you what the answer is? Okay, local market first. Okay, I see that E. There's a lot of support for E there. F, E, okay, good. Well, truth is neither of them. We don't know. We don't really know whether we should be focusing on E or F first. And that's because of some simple reasoning. We don't know what the problem is. All right, so this, as someone correctly identified, this value chain is completely cut off, right? So product is not actually even making it into the export market. 
So the question is, why? Why has the chain broken here? Is it a problem with export customs? Is it that the product does not meet the required EU legislation, regulation to get into the market? Is it because freight is down and they can't, we can't move, right? Um, or is it because your processor is suddenly out of business and can no longer process what you need to process them? We don't actually know what the problem is. If we know, once we know what the problem is, we can figure out, can we solve that? Or is that unsolvable? Like can, we can't really affect, uh, you know, if it, it's a the bigger problem of ships no longer docking. I mean, that's a bit more challenging for us to solve, right? So the choice about where to intervene also matters on what actually the problem is. And that's the beauty of value chain analysis. We'll sit down, take a very close look at your supply chain, figure out where the problems are, and then work out, okay, what solutions could we do? Could we improve this? Is it feasible? Is it gonna take us a week, a month, a year? What sort of resources do we need? And then let's focus in on the most feasible um, areas that we can have impact as quickly as possible. Okay, so that was constraints, binding constraints and leverage points for value chains. Okay, now let's switch gears a little bit. Um, so once, once we've looked at a, um, a value chain and understand where the weakness are, we're in a much better position to design an upgrading strategy or a strategy, a business plan, for example, for an individual um, agripreneur. Now, the question is, which markets, I'm gonna give you, which market should I focus on? I, I take us back to remember our quiz before, which said we, everyone agreed the market pull B was much more important. The question now is, we have identified that your product has three markets it can sell into. You know, for example, A could be the local wet market around the corner. B could be the supermarket, um, you know, down in, in the capital city. Um, C could be the, um, the big hotels opening up around the corner. All right. A, B or C. So your product has interest from multiple markets. Which market should you focus on? A, B or C? Let me change that question. Tell me which one you think looks like the bigger market, the better market. I gave it away. Um, a, B or C and why? C, thank you. We've got one bidder for C. Do people agree? Do they, people agree that C looks a bit bigger? Uh, a, we have an A there, okay, good. Well, from this simple diagram, we probably look at C because it's a large market, all right? And it's got a big pool, so it's ready to take a lot of produce. So if you can pro provide or produce a lot of produce, this looks like a very interesting market, albeit we'd need to take a little bit of a deeper look, make sure you can meet the requirements. Once we identify markets, which markets we wanna focus on, whether that's for an agribusiness or for a value chain or for a national value chain, we then wanna focus on the areas in the supply chain. So which area do you think we should focus on here? A, B, C, or D? This value chain looks a little bit broken and disfigured. Um, and that's often the case. A lot of our supply chains don't work as optimally as they can. They need a bit of love and attention and improvement in different areas, not just at one area. Um, so we just need to figure out where to put it. Anyone want to put some ideas forth on which might be the, where do we need to focus our attention on? Basically, we have multiple areas to focus on, um, all of the above. However, things such as um, D, I take your point there, processing, D and B, yeah, multiple areas. So this is good. We can figure out where we've got, say, maybe some bigger areas to work here because this link is completely missing. So we need to help build out the link, whether that's find a <laughs> transporting option to move from production to processing. We're not quite sure what the problem is, but we can figure it out. And of course, markets. 
here we could see that there's a good opportunity to go into the export market, but we need to, to build it out. So really um, a strengthening, uh, strengthening strategy needs to look at multiple areas at once, not just one area. So not just look at production, but also look at the businesses um, processing challenges as well as marketing challenges, but just to figure out which are the most important. This kind of value chain approach helps us intervene a little bit better. So instead of doing surgery, because sometimes I make the analogy that intervening in your building a supply chain or intervening in an existing national value chain is kind of like surgery. You have a system like a body that has many systems. It has the respiratory system. It has the, um, it has the blood. It has all these different systems operating, the muscles, um, the organs. So you don't need to in intervene everywhere. You just need to intervene where the problem is because you don't want to kill your patient, so to say. So when we don't do the intervention, when we don't do the analysis, sometimes we can go a little bit bluntly and intervene a little bit heavily in areas that we shouldn't. Instead, we just want to go in nice and neatly and just ask, uh, address the area where we see that there's a real problem, small incision, get in, get out quickly. So to just give you an example um, of how we would do this for uh, a youth group, for example, is once we've understood their um, value chain or their supply chain, we can then work out whether we need to build in new components, whether we need to start working and building in a nursery into their business operations or to do their production or where they've got small issues. Um, for an example, we would establish, this is for an industry, but we would establish a private nursery. We can run gap trainings for the farmers to help them improve their yields. Um, we can help connect the, agri the young, the youth to um, processes, get rid of the middleman, um, do some direct sourcing to the buyers. We can do R&D trials on processing simultaneously to help them get better yields for their process goods. Um, we can look and approach local supermarkets to stock the value-added products so we can help develop a marketing strategy. And then, of course, doing a whole lot of coordination of all these different things. So this is how we do transformation of value chain step by step. We select the right the value chain to begin with. We then analyze it to better understand where the problems are, where the problems are. We know then how to intervene. And we can come up with a range of integrated activities that Juan mentioned, some business planning, some marketing, some production support that can really, when brought together on the same business or the same value chain at the same time can really move mountains, so to say. So just to give you an example that we've actually um, got this sort of thing in operation in the region. In a year, we've built, um, we've been building out the Jamaica's turmeric value chain because we did it market analysis and saw it had great market potential. So in, in the space of, well, yeah, a year, we have um, established two private nurseries. So we've done the built cost of production and business plans for nurseries. We've organized the transport to get um, to a number of different pilot farmers. So um, done a whole lot of training for farmers who are not used to um, producing turmeric and needed to improve their practices um, and then have linked these guys, these farmers to processes so that there's direct sale. And now for the first time, some of the local manufacturers in Jamaica are actually sourcing local turmeric for their curry powder. Of course, a lot of trainings left, right and center to help everybody get up to speed and a lot of coordination to make sure they're all working together. So this value chain approach beyond just being theory is a way we intervene on the grounds and whether this is for a full national value chain or for a youth group, um, for this project, where we really start linking, understanding the business side at each start part of the chain, we start linking them all together um, and get something really actionable on the ground. So we change to do to move from something that's a bit fragmented like this, as you can see here, sort of a value chain, nursery to farmers, to processors to exporters. It looked like this to begin with, everybody sort of doing their own thing, farmers here and there, a couple of processors here, they don't really know who the farmers are, the exporters haven't contacted the farmers, it's all a bit disorganized. Under this kind of work, we try to bring it all together so it runs um, more smoothly. Okay, so that's, I think towards the end of the, this short presentation, um, just to reiterate the different steps we take, selection, assessment, business planning, and then integrated training. So that reminds me, just um, in order not to leave this just a one-off training and, and that's it, we wanted to give you a homework 
um, particularly the Ministry of Agriculture, to help us set this train off, so to say, on the, on the right footing. Um, and that's really got to do with helping us identify some of those um, products with the best um, market opportunities. So we put it as a challenge to the ministry team that Juan mentioned um, to do a three-step market assessment survey, because this will get us um, at least a good step forward in identifying which crops um, or might also have great potential for our ag young agripreneurs um, and can help inform them. The, th the steps are quite simple. The first one is to come up with a list up to you. I've just given you an example here. You can develop it as you wish, as many um, crops or commodities as you wish, but you list them all out. Um, and then we take that same list and we will send you a uh, survey monkey survey, which you can go through quite quickly. And you put, you do uh, each, each commodity into the survey one by one. Each commodity takes about two minutes. To, to fill out the survey, ask, answer a few questions really about the market side so we can better understand the market potential. Once we FAO gets the results of all that screening survey, say 10 or 20 different commodities, we will then analyze the results and then we would welcome a discussion with the ministry team um, to just refine, to understand the survey, to discuss, to really knuckle down on understanding which commodities do and don't have potential based on your local knowledge and your understanding of how the markets work. And that will allow us to re refine your list and then figure out which are the top, say, five or six that really have great market potential, which um, can then be shared with the agripreneurs um, and other sector stakeholders who are interested in really better understanding the market opportunities. So, to keep us moving forward in this project, this is what we propose as the next step, as the homework to be done um, in the next you know, month or so, so that we can get going on a strong foot um, and help work with the, with the young teams uh, on how to, to then take the next step forward with developing their business plans um, and strategies for their supply chain. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time and energies and interacting with me today. I really appreciate it. I know it's a Friday afternoon. The weekend is calling. Um, it's been my pleasure. Um, I really enjoy it. I welcome any questions or comments you have. Um, and uh, I would like, of course, to, to um, thank very much um, the ministry for having us today. Um, with big, of course, um, very special acknowledgement of the ministers um, who have uh, opened so ceremoniously this project and to say that we are looking forward to a wonderful and very productive collaboration for the youth. So thank you very much. And, and uh, thank you. I have to acknowledge thank you for staying so long um, and actually joining the training. That is uh, quite remarkable. So uh, thank you. And I'll uh, let me know if you have any questions or I'll, I'll hand the floor back over to Juan who may facilitate a Q&A. Thank you so much, Brie. Um, that was very clear, that uh, very uh, engaging and illustrative. I, I hope uh, that all the others felt um, that way. I think that uh, that gives you a very good flavor of what we have in store for you in terms of the value chain um, um, training, there would be more, you know, on that, but this is just the, the, the initial step. Um, we have some minutes, we have gone a little bit over time, uh, but I think it was necessary. We understand, like we said, it's Friday, it is almost four o'clock for you. So I like just to give some space for burning questions you may have, or from observations that Colville, other ministry staff, or from the partners, would have, you know, regarding um, the project, uh, what, it, what it is intending to do and what has been proposed specifically um, um, as the homework uh, following up this, this initial training. The, the floor is open. You can use the raise hand application if you like, or you can ask questions on the chat box. Okay, not much coming at this time of the day from the general participants. Um, I would ask uh, the, the partner institutions 
and Colville if there are burning questions or clarifications that they would like to be made at this point. Um, I don't really have much of a comment except to say I think that that training was very clear. Um, um, placing the concept of the value chain process, the, upgrade, you know, the upgrading process from an analysis right through to upgrading, I think was done really, really well. Um, I think what this is bringing home the, in terms of the assignment is that although, and I could anticipate on the, the youth entrepreneurs side, that they have particular interest, but perhaps, you know, you need to be a bit more open-minded in terms of assessing really and truly what these opportunities are before settling on, you know, an upgrading plan and investment. So, so just to ensure that there's viability and sustainability. Okay, so, so I think that what Cole really is suggesting is, is very relevant. It's just not, you know, um, let, let's give the opportunity to put to the test some of the assumptions that the groups may have about, you know, the market potential, the profitability, you know, the growth, etc. elements that Brie would have shared with you in terms of the change that you have been producing. So in terms of next steps, we will be sending this very simple table with very simple instructions. Um, and we can be following up with you, Colville and all the colleagues uh, uh, to convene for um, just, just as the follow-up to for any questions you may have at, uh, on the listing of what you think are the priority um, um, products, either fresh or value added. Um, I know that some work would have been done on the existing uh, analysis would have been done on the existing crops that the youth groups have been engaging with. I mean, there's mention in the project document about sweet potato, peanut, vegetables. Um, there was mentioning this morning about seasonings and wines, etc. So what we want, you, we may want, you may want to include this, you know, in list to undergo the market screening exercise. And you may want to bring forward information and analysis that you would have done, you know, that, 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 that illustrates clearly and that provides evidence that these are um, sectors with high potential. And you may also add others that are not being dealt, but that may represent good prospects for these, for the youth groups, you know, based on information uh, uh, that you have. So, so, in terms of the, the next steps, we'll be sending this, uh, this, this what, what Brie projected, this, this um, template for, and we'll be discussing with you um, on how you could organize a consultation um, uh, before you proceed and trying to set a date by which you could send that list uh, back to us and we can start uh, processing information. Are there any other questions? And call and if not, call me. Does that sounds like like the plan, like the next step? Yes, uh, yes, clearly. Um, and uh, we initially, when we when we started conceptualizing the project, uh, we had established a value chain team. So we may want to add or augment that team. Um, but yeah, I think we can we can respond to that. Uh, that first assignment pretty quickly. So I'll be in touch with uh, my colleagues in, in the Youth Affairs Department in national mobilization, as well as, well as those on our side in the ministry here and the, the colleagues from the, the other agencies, as mentioned, the, the college, CED, uh, and the Bureau of Standards. Okay. Okay, so then Brie will be sending you that um, that document, and then you can discuss internally, you know, um, how to proceed with it. And if you have any questions, we're right here.
to, to, to get back at you. Um, well, uh, if there are not further comments or questions, I'd like to thank you for the organization and for your participation. I have seen that the number of participants have remained consistent, around 40 plus participants, uh, which demonstrates you know, both the interest and the commitment uh, to this process. And um, well, very happy about that. And I wish you um, a good rest of your day and, a, and an excellent weekend. weekend. This has been a, a very good start and very timely in anticipation of your celebrations of World Food Day tomorrow. So with that, I thank you. Thank you, Brie, for your presentation. Thanks uh, to my colleagues in uh, Barbados for the IT arrangements and other that are invisible, but who might be behind the whole organization. Thanks a lot and have a great weekend. Thank you as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Uh, Colleen, we, we can speak maybe uh, just afterwards just to determine how best we can get um, a registration of the participants list. Yes, of course. No problem okay. at all. Juan. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye.